Get ready for a big old laundry list of a bunch of proof texts showing that the Sinaitic Covenant or God's law is for Christians. All right, so what I'm doing this week is just a little bit different. This is called proof texting. I'm using text without any type of context to prove that my argument is right. It's not the way that I prefer to do things, but sometimes it is good for people to see all the texts that just have something to do with a particular topic. My particular topic, of course, is that the Torah is for us, for Christians, where in the world does it say this in the Bible? And just seeing it all together should help you make sense of things. And it's just another piece of the puzzle. So I'll go here first, Exodus chapter 12, verse 24. And you shall observe this event in context. This is Passover, the first Passover. And they are to have this Passover thingy, this ordinance for you and your children for ever. Now this word is olam and it in fact does mean like forever, like don't stop doing this. And the thing is in the Christian world we have stopped doing this. Now just in, th in case that you might think that we were to stop when Jesus came along, well that same word is used here in Exodus 15 18 and the Lord shall reign forever and ever. It's the same word olam. It really does mean forever, like don't stop doing it. Exodus 31, 17. It, and here is the weekly Sabbath, it is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. Like, don't stop doing it. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, but on the seventh day. So this is the seventh day Sabbath, which would be Saturday. It would be the last day of the week. He ceased from labor and was refreshed. We're to do the same. And, of course, we have this thing, Israel. Israel is like an olive tree. And in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, you know that as a Gentile, that you are grafted in. I wanna show you what that looks like real quick. It means that you're in that tree and that whole tree is Israel. I think one of the common misconceptions is that Gentiles, when they're grafted into the the tree, Israel, that somehow they're still Gentiles. Now, the thing is, you kind of are, you didn't grow up as an ethnic Jew, uh, you're Gentile in that way, but true Israel, the true followers of God, this is like Israel. And when you believe in faith, you're grafted in. And so in the same way in the Old Testament that all those sojourners or alien strangers when they were brought among the community, they were to be treated just like the Israelites. Same is true for us. When I am grafted into the Commonwealth of Israel, I'm to be treated just like them because I am them. Deuteronomy 5.29, oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. And so here we have the word always. And always here means always. Yahweh wants us to keep his commandments always, that it might go well with us because that's what Yahweh's commandments help us do. They help us live a life of, of wisdom, righteousness, and we get to go on in like healthy living. And that's a good thing. Matthew 5, 17. So now you can see we're transitioning into the New Testament where in fact most of the proof texts are that we're supposed to follow those commandments. The first is from Yeshua. In the Sermon on the Mount, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now in the second half of the verse, you're going to see that we really want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I've had people tell me that as long as they get into heaven, they don't care if they're the least because, you know, it's all the same. No, it's not all the same. And it's important that we take seriously God's word. Right here in the Sermon on the Mount, Yeshua is telling us, when he says he fulfilled the law, I'll leave a link up here, fulfilled means Yeshua is the goal of the law. Yeshua was the Lamb of God. He did it all properly. He did it right. And it all points to him. It doesn't mean that's the end of the law like it stopped. It's goal, not stopped. And so I want to be the kind of teacher, and if you're a pastor, I would just say, hey, you know what? 
between me and you, if you want to be a good shepherd, if you are teaching people to um, not observe the Torah, the law of God, then you are just doing a disservice to your congregation and you, you mustn't do that. So I would just say, hey, um, search the scriptures and repent if you need to and move on and be a great teacher because that's what God has designed you to do. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 15, 13, and he answered and said to them, why do you, you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? So Yeshua is talking here to the Pharisees and notice that Yeshua is juxtaposing God's commands from Sarah, Pharisaical commands. God, Yeshua clearly wants them to follow God's commandments, but he doesn't want them to like mess up God's commandments because they're trying to do their own commandments. And don't do that. Luke 1, 5 and 6. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he and his wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. I mean, look, when I was growing up, I always revered Zacharias and Elizabeth, and we should. You know, look, there is no doubt that we are righteous because we have Yeshua as our Savior and that His blood cleanses us from all impurity. But at the same time, we can't just stop there. We're to repent and turn from our past ways of doing things, turn to something else. And that's what Zachariah and Elizabeth did. What they did was they followed the commandments of God. They did righteous in God's sight. And that's exactly what God wanted of them. And so look, if you ever transgress the law, just know that you can confess your sins to God and he is faithful and just to forgive you and me from all unrighteousness. But what we can't do is perpetually like take advantage of that. No, we repent that we might walk in Yahweh's ways and that's what Zechariah and Elizabeth did. Luke 23, 55 and 56. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And look at this. And on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, just as they were supposed to, they rested according to the commandment. So even though Yeshua has died, these ladies who have followed Yeshua have been taught by Yeshua and they rested just as the commandment said. They should be an example to all of us. Now, here's Yeshua himself, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I think a lot of people wanna tell me that this is the commandments that Jesus gave, not that the Father gave, not that Yahweh gave. Look, I don't want to treat you like, like be condescending, but there's this thing called monotheism. If you're a Christian monotheist, it means that you believe that Jesus and God are the exact same thing. Therefore, for you, Jesus' commandments are God's commandments. What was given at Sinai might as well have been given by Yeshua. In John 14, 21, Yeshua says, He who has my commandments, or the Father's commandments, one and the same, and keeps them is the one who loves me. You gotta remember, we don't love Yeshua Jesus the way that we think. I mean, we tend to think in Western terms and we love in the ways that we want to be loved and such. But the thing is, God has told us how he feels love and it is incumbent upon us to fall in line with the way that God wants us to love him, even if that might feel a little wonky when we you know, first start doing it. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and by, abide in his love. If you want to abide in Jesus, you must keep his commandments. Romans 7, 12, so we're turning a corner here. Here's the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to a people who are using the law of God to try to earn salvation. And, and you just can't do that. And so 
Paul in Romans is going to basically say, hey, you're misusing the law. The law is designed for a couple of things. It's, it's basically designed to show you what sin is, how to walk in righteousness. And so when you don't have Jesus as your savior, uh, you can look into that perfect law and you can take note that your life doesn't measure up to that law. And so you need a savior. But once you find Jesus, it still serves the same purpose. It still shows you where you fall short and it shows you how to walk in righteousness. So then, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good, which it is. And he wants to make sure that the, his audience understands that because he doesn't want them to think that, um, you know, once you find Yeshua that the law is no good anymore. It certainly is. And so he wants to be clear. Romans 13, 19, for this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Now these are all laws in the Torah. And if there's any other commandment, meaning that if there's any other commandment that is in the Torah that addresses this you know, rubric, it's summed up in this saying. And so here's the Apostle Paul, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now we know that Yeshua said there's you know, two great commandments. The first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And a lot of people I'm around often say those are the two things that we need to do. But I must admit, and you must admit too, that that can get a little bit nebulous, a little ethereal. It's like, can't we put a little, little you know, substance or feet to that? And that's where the rest of the Torah comes in. It shows us how to love God and love neighbor. And this is an instance in Romans chapter 13 where the Apostle Paul looks at the phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and explicitly says that some of those other commandments show us how to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. What matters is keeping the commandments of God. Now this one's interesting if you don't know what's going on. Um, circumcision is certainly a command in the Bible. So if you look at Leviticus chapter 12 and verse three, there is certainly a law to do that. But there's that law, but then there is a framework that was really like happening during second temple Judaism. And that would be those of the circumcision and those of the uncircumcision. Those are the circumcision who identified as being ethnically Jewish. And they thought because they were ethnically Jewish that they had a part in the eternal covenant with God. There was like that framework. It really didn't have anything to do with the law and Leviticus. It had everything to do with like a cultural custom. There were people getting confused. They were like saying, and this is like part of the, like the big reason for the book of Galatians. It's like, do we have to be ethnically um, Jewish, circumcised in that way in order to be a part of the covenant community. And the Apostle Paul comes strongly against that. I'll leave a link up here. But the bottom line is, is basically Paul is saying here, whether you're ethnically Jewish or you're not ethnically Jewish, that is you're Gentile, you're Goy, or you're other than Jewish, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is if you are saved in such a way that the spirit is in you, that you've believed on faith, and now you are following the commandments of God. That's exactly what the verse says. Ephesians chapter six, verses one through three. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Here's the apostle Paul citing the commandments of God as, as something that is important for our walk with our Messiah. It's something that we need to be doing so that it might be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And so this is important when we're walking in God's commandments, we're also walking in wisdom, things that are good for our lives, good for our communities, and it leads to long life. And we need to be about that. Now, here's the Apostle Paul talking to his protege, Timothy. Um, he is a new pastor in a tough spot in Ephesus, and he's got a lot of people who are older than him, and the Apostle Paul is instructing him on how to lead this congregation. Here's a link on some of those issues, and. You need to watch that, it's important. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even though the commandment is singular here, it's like a catchphrase in that day for all the commandments of God and so, Paul is saying to Timothy as a pastor, you need to not only preach it, 
you need to do it. Put those things together, people will watch your life and they will be transformed. 1 John 2, 3. Now, John, boy, I tell you what, he hits hard and he ain't gonna pull any punches. Um, you'll see it in the next verse. But we'll start with this. By this, we know that we have come to know him. Is it that we've gone to church 100 times, that we raise our hands in church, that we give to the poor? No. Well, those are could some of that's part of his commandments, but it's about keeping his commandments. You wanna know if you're doing right and walking with God, and that the Spirit is transforming your life and that you're you're, you're doing everything you're supposed to do, just read those commandments. Are you doing those things? It's a little bit more than that because you know some of those people in the Bible times, they were doing those commandments. Um, but as we're gonna see in John, it's not just about doing the commandments, it's that we're also being transformed by the Spirit of God, by faith in Jesus, but the two have got to work together. And John is going to say that in just a little while. You'll see. 1 John 2, 4, the one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Pretty strong words there. And the truth is not in him. And so again, these things have got to work in tandem. You can't you know, discover, you know, whether you were growing up following Torah or not, uh, discover Jesus and put your faith in him and then just live however you want. You can't do that. You've got to follow Yahweh's commandments that were given at Sinai. First John 2, 7, beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. Yep, in Acts 15, Moses was preached everywhere. Um, and in the very next verse, uh, John is going to say, well, I gave you the old commandment, you've known it, but now a new commandment I give you and the new commandment is just that you would do that old commandment, but you would do it in the power of the Spirit. And of course, even Yeshua says, you know, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. But the thing is, is that commandment was actually in the Torah, but they hadn't, see it, hadn't seen it actually lived out in the way of Jesus. And so Jesus is like, look at me, look at how I'm doing it and look how I walk with the Father. You go and do likewise. 1 John 3, 21 through 24, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do these things that are pleasing in, in his sight. Yahweh responds to his sheep, but the sheep listen to his voice and the sheep do what the shepherd says to do. That's following the commandments. Now, I've put a blue box around verse 23 because this seems to be a way that people can say, well, the commandment is actually not the law, it's something else. Well, let's read it. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us, which is true. And this is what I was talking about just a little bit before, that following the Torah, doing the law, has to be in conjunction with following this other commandment that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. So I want you to see that believing in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, is not mutually exclusive from following the Torah. It's just that they need to work in tandem. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And so notice that the Spirit is now present in this verse where John just wants to bring those two ideas together. We've got to first follow Jesus and then we follow those commandments because Yahweh is writing his Torah on our hearts and those two elements are being brought together and now we walk in the Spirit, living righteous lives, doing what God has told us to do in the Torah. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. When you first start walking in the Torah, because it's foreign to a lot of you, it will feel burdensome. It's just, you know, like riding a bike. Riding a bike, if you think about it, is actually pretty easy, but it's not easy when you get started. I tell you, that was my experience too. When I started following the Torah, there was like a, uh, a cultural thing I had to learn. It just took a little while. It was awkward at first. Actually having to walk away from your old culture. Your old culture, you were celebrating other holy days like Easter. I don't want to be you know, too mean on that, but Easter, like Christmas, some other things. And to do what is going to feel to you at the very beginning like very Jewishy, 
It does, it just feels a little bit awkward at first. But let me tell you something. I've been doing it for a while and it is actually very life-giving. It's joyful. Here's another thing I don't think people know is they have a hard time differentiating between what's Bible, God's instruction in the Bible, and what is uh, tradition in Judaism. You've got to separate those two things out. Tradition in Judaism, that can be burdensome. But if you just do what's in the Bible, what God has asked us to do, it's not burdensome at all. I'm like living proof. I'm, I'm doing it. It's spiritual and life-giving. It makes me feel like I'm walking closer, closer, closer with Jesus. And I know that I'm inviting in him because I'm doing his commandments. Second John 1, 6, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. Oh, Revelation 12, 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who do two things, keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. This whole faith thing that we are constantly thinking about is vitally important. We need to have faith. And that's why we're saved. We're saved by faith, not of our works so that no one can boast. But if you have the Spirit of God, you will do things consistent with the Spirit because the Spirit dwells in you and the Spirit wants to obey the Father. And so you hold to those commandments. You keep the commandments. So those things are being brought together just like John said. Revelation 14, 12, here's the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Notice that the perseverance is connected to those who do the commandments in, in face of adversity. They just do what God tells them to do. They're observing those feast days. They are um, they're eating kosher. They are uh, uh, doing those Ten Commandments. They're, they're reading the scriptures and they're, they're just doing everything it tells them to do. Now, there's a lot of things we can't do because there is no temple. Um, I can't do some things that are uh, female specific, nor can females do things that are male specific. That, but it doesn't mean I don't believe in the female ones. It just means that I can't do them because I'm not female. It doesn't apply to me in that way. But here's the point. I've given you a lot of proof text to put in all in one place to show you how important this is to our God forever. I'll see you next week.